Hey, in the primary video, we showed how to use contact analysis to find the point when this model of a compliant centrifugal clutch would touch the housing and begin to transmit torque. Now, there's another way we could get this that I want to show you here um, so that you can compare the two methods and, and uh, then you can use the one that you feel like is, uh, is most efficient. Now, so we're looking at an edge view of the clutch and you can see um, and we're plotting here our directional deformation um, in the x-axis. Um, probably not a very helpful uh, direction to plot here. Um, I can come over here in my definition and change this to the y-axis. Now I need to update that, so let's evaluate results. Okay, so you can see, kind of makes sense. If we think about this as having a pivot here at the right, um, and along this tip, the tangent to that uh, vector would point vertical. So it has lowest moment arm and the largest component of that direction. But you notice that neither this point nor the other point in the x direction is where the minimum gap is. So it falls somewhere in here. Um, wouldn't it be nice to be able to extract that parameter? Well, there is a way to do that. In the prior video, I showed creating a cylindrical coordinate system, uh, but then I neglected to use that. So if you look, this is a cylindrical um, coordinate system, and I've named it clutch center cylindrical. And you can see it's showing the center there. See how that's at the center of the radius? And I see x is the radial, y is a rotational axis, and then z is out of the plane. Uh, so we could use that. What I care about is the displacement radially, in this case, well, it's going to call the x direction, but that'll be the radial direction. So if I come down to my directional definition and I change my coordinate system, so I select the clutch center cylindrical, and now the radial one we saw was the x-axis, so I'll select x, and you can see it's showing that there to help uh, with the illustration. Now I can update this. And sure enough, the peak is right in this region where the, um, the largest display is happening. Let's put the max on there. Hmm. Well, that is, uh, that is interesting, actually. That is not where I would have expected the max to be. Um, let's look at this distribution a little bit. So I can also change this. So let's do, let's do zero, two, five. Okay, so now what I've done is I've created a uh, small range. You notice that they're radial bands that essentially have the same uh, displacement here. Um, let's zero in on this a little bit more. Okay, so you can see that this is calculating a larger displacement here at the inside than the outside, um, though that difference is not a great deal. Um, you can see that that varies, so the green color, um, by about 3% or so um, from this point out to there. It does give me an indication of where that is going to happen. Um, and then we can have a, uh, so we could use that and at least get an approximate idea of, of when it's going to displace by extracting the, uh, the maximum value of that displacement. And when I've got a radial displacement equal to the, to the value of the um, gap between the clutch then and the housing, then it would engage at that speed. Or in other words, I could analyze a series of speeds and then extract um, the maximum radial displacement and get an approximate um, clutch diameter that it would engage with at that speed and make a very make a, a graph of those. Um, so there's an example of a quicker way of getting that analysis out the results out that you could use um, to help refine your contact analysis. And you can compare the accuracy of those two, particularly to look at these over a broader range of speeds rather than 
do repeat the contact analysis for each one.